This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 147, with Carlos Lara. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobster here and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today and in today's show we're going to be looking at how privatized banking really works and integrating Austrian economics with the infinite banking concept. My guest today is Carlos Lara. I first met Carlos when I became involved with the Nelson Nash Institute and with the Infinite Banking Practitioners Program. Carlos is the CEO of United Services and Trust Corporation, a consulting firm specializing in business advisory services for privately held corporations. United Services and Trust Corporation was incorporated in 1976 and is headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee. The firm's primary services are capital formation, corporate trusts, debitor-creditor relations, and business crisis. Carlos's background in business rehabilitation, commercial banking, and credit restructuring makes him a regular speaker at business conferences. During the 1980s, he taught classes on credit management to credit executives seeking the ABCE accreditation, now the Certified Credit Executive for the National Association of Credit Management. Carlos has also held all the required licenses as a registered broker dealer and member of the National Association of Securities Dealers with an extensive experience in the financial services industry. He is a free market advocate in the Austrian school tradition, frequently writing and speaking on the subject. And in 2013, he co-produced the IBC Practitioners Program, an educational training course on the theory of the infinite banking concept, which is specifically designed for licensed financial professionals. Carlos co-hosts a fantastic podcast, The Laura Murphy Show with Bob Murphy, and also produces The Laura Murphy Report, which is published monthly. Please share your feedback and thoughts with me on today's interview. You can let me know your thoughts on Twitter by tweeting me at MC Lobsher or by email at info at CashflowNinja.com. And please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at CashflowNinja.com or texting CashflowNinja, one word, all capitalized to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. You can support the show by becoming a patron on Patreon for $10 a month. And when you become a patron, you get access to our private Facebook page and a Cashflow Ninja t-shirt. You can become a patron by visiting cashflowninja.com forward slash support. Have you read Rich Dad Poor Dad? Are you interested in real estate investing and don't know where to start or to get the results you want? For valuable information to get you started, visit JoinOps Properties at joinopsproperties.com. If you're not earning at least 8% on your cash, you do not want to miss the private lending presentation for non-accredited investors done by Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott. Discover how to create an income stream from real estate without the management headaches. You can access the presentation at CashflowNinja.com forward slash private lending. Spartan Invest have a proven plan and system helping investors creating passive income and wealth through turnkey real estate ownership in the exciting market of Birmingham, Alabama. Find out why Birmingham has got it going on, why it's a steal right now, why it's a millennial hangout, a hidden gem, and one of the most exciting investment opportunities you have never heard of. You can download your free report, Five Big Reasons to Invest in the Magical City of Birmingham, Alabama, at CashflowNinja.com forward slash Spartan. 
I've spoken about the most powerful system on the planet, on the show, the banking system. And my firm, Valhalla Wealth Financial, helps people reclaim the banking function within their own lives through leveraging the premium tools and strategies of the wealthy. If you're interested in reclaiming the banking function within your own life and the infinite banking concept, you can access a free webinar presentation at cashflowninja.com forward slash be the bank. Carlos, it's an honor having you on. Welcome to the show. Michael, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Can you please share a little bit about your background and journey with my listeners? Well, sure. Uh, I'd be glad to do that. You know, I can take that in all kinds of different directions. Uh, um, I, um, I started in the business that I'm in, uh, which is uh, working with the with, uh, business owners of, of closely held corporations way, way, way back. Um, I actually incorporated in 1976. So I lose track of time, Michael. What is that? That's over 40 years, I guess. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been doing this a very long time. And um, I, I work with uh, businessmen and business owners in particular of, uh, of companies. Um, but my area of expertise is in uh, financial crises. You know, when 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 companies get into a real serious financial bind, um, I'm known as uh, sort of a workout specialist, um, trying to uh, you know pull the, the business back into profitability before they take the step of going into Chapter Eleven. So uh, the nature of my work involves um, getting together with, with, with creditors, uh, with banks of the business, and trying to pound out a formula, a solution to try to get the company back on its feet. So that, that's been the primary work that I've done all these years. Um, I, you know, I get involved in other aspects of working with business owners, obviously, that have nothing to do with financial crises. But... That's been the, the majority part of my work. For listeners not, that's not familiar with Austrian economics and the Austrian school of economic thought, can you please share a little bit more about this philosophy? Uh, well, sure. I sure can. Uh, you know, um, I, I actually uh, was moved into looking into Austrian economics by accident. Uh, I personally uh, went through a period where I had a major financial reversal come upon me. You know, this is after I'd been in business for a long time and being in a, fin a financial guru of sort. Um, but back, back uh, during the Reagan, Reagan's administration, uh, the, the the uh, we we went through this period of a of a complete overhaul of the, the taxing system. So when we ran into the 1986 Tax Reform Act, I mean it really uh, you know obviously it was intended to reduce taxes at all levels, and they, in fact it did. Uh, you know they brought down the the income tax uh, down to about 28 percent. And then, of course, the capital gains tax down to 20%. So there was a major reduction there on taxes. But at the same time, it seems that every time that, you know, Congress acts to do a good thing, they create another big, huge problem. And that's exactly what happened because uh, it, uh, it, it, it created major disruptions in the economy. Uh, for example, it completely collapsed the commercial and a residential real estate market to levels uh, not seen since the Great Depression. That's how severe that tax reform act, the, the, the kind of offshoot problems it created. And then in 1987, of course, we had Black Monday. So we saw major bankruptcies of all different kinds of companies uh, nationwide during that period of time. And uh, it was hard not to get caught up in that. And so uh, I, I, I myself did not avoid it. So it was at that time that I, I was asking myself, what the heck happened here? You know, why did I not 
see this coming. And of course, uh, not only being a financial uh, expert myself, I also surrounded myself with with the top notch financial advisors, you know, attorneys, uh, accountants, tax attorneys, you know, to help me uh, work things out. They didn't see this coming, and so it was at that point that I actually went on a quest to find out uh, a lot more of how economics works. Um, obviously, whatever I was taught in school <laughs> didn't prepare me for this. And so I, I actually, in that quest over a period of time, I ran into the works of the Austrian School of Economics. And of course, it's, it's not actually a place. Uh, and it's, of course, it's referred to as Austrian because most of the major thinkers uh, of that school were from Austria. Uh, the most famous of all, of course, is Ludwig von Mises. Uh, but there's a, there's a lot of, uh, great Austrian thinkers. And I would say that Austrian economics is headquartered more here in the United States than it is anywhere else, even though it is a worldwide school. And it's more of a way of thinking, Michael, rather than an actual place. Um, as you well know, most of our thinking today is uh, is completely uh, Keynesian economics. Uh, this is what we all learned in school. You know, if you took any kind of economics or finance, business, this is what you were taught. So basically, all universities—I don't care at what level they are, whether it's from Harvard or from the smallest community college. This is what they teach us, is Keynesian economics. So the Keynesian way of thinking is embedded, you know, in, in, our, in our thoughts about how economies work. Uh, Austrian economics is completely different from that. Again, it's a, it's a way of thinking that's different from Keynesian economics. And it was through the Austrian school that I realized what had happened to me in 1986. And so um, uh, I, I would suggest uh, that your listeners uh, perhaps start to simply to Google Austrian economics, and hopefully that may begin to, you know, pique their interest and learn more about it. And there's some great uh, writers and uh, books uh, by Austrians that uh, will will have a way of uh, opening the eyes of, of a lot of folks about how, you know, how economies really work from the Austrian point of view. Now, Carlos, you've co-authored a fantastic book, How Privatized Banking Really Works, Integrating Austrian Economics with the Infinite Banking Concept. And in the book, you and Bob Murphy really break down the problem of how our money and the banking function within our own lives and banking institutions have been hijacked from the people. And you offer a sound money solution and then also discuss a little bit of the role that infinite banking plays within your sound money solution. Let's start with discussing the problem of how our money and banking institutions have been hijacked away from the people. Can you elaborate more on this? Uh, well, sure. Uh, obviously, um, uh, and just to mention again, uh, one of the ways in which I became uh, more acquainted with Austrian economics, I, I was reading some of the great treatises by some of the greats like Ludwig von Mises and uh, Murray Rothbard. And uh, actually, Bob, you know, had done some study guides on both of those two two volumes, which, by the way, are very, very large volumes, and, you know, they're, they, they can be difficult to read, uh, and so Bob did a great job with some study guides on that, and I, and that's actually how I became acquainted with Bob. I, I realized in, in looking at one of his study guides that he actually had moved to Nashville, and that's how we got, we got started. Now, um, uh, or partnered up and then eventually led to the writing of how privatized banking really works. Uh, for those that are uh, 
have a copy of that book or, 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 or want a copy of it, obviously you can find it on Amazon. But in the back of our book, we, we list all the great Austrians there. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole section in the back that would, would help your, your listeners even become even more familiar with some of the greats in Austrian thinking. Uh, at the time Bob and I met, I had studied a great deal of Murray Rothbard's uh, writings. And it was through Murray Rothbard that I learned, you know, how uh, banking, uh, you know, really works in our, in our, in our, in our nation today and, and found out that basically this is kind of how it works worldwide. And the whole idea of how money and banking has more or less been taken away from us as individuals basically started a long time ago. Um, the blueprint for the Federal Reserve, which is the, the central bank operating um, in our country today, uh, is, is part of a system. They call it the Federal Reserve System. And and it is linked to all commercial banks. And so our central bank, through the use of our commercial banks, expand or contract credit in our economy. And so so it is a, it is a system. And and so when 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 you look at commercial banking today, their primary function, of course, is loans and lines of credit. This is basically what they do. Uh, but it's the central bank that when it wants to expand credit in the economy or and or contract credit in the economy, uh, it, it does it through the commercial banking system. And so uh, Murray was uh, excellent in uh, describing that whole procedure. And it was through understanding that procedure that I realized that uh, bubbles are created. When, when credit is expanded, it tends to create bubbles in the economy or booms is another way to, to picture it. And uh, these booms um, can't be sustained forever. Eventually, eventually they're going to pop. And Murray was, was very good at explaining that piece to me so well, exactly how that system operates to create credit and to uh, expand it as well as to contract it. And, and it's a pretty complicated uh, procedure. It's so com uh, complicated that I guess John Maynard Keynes, but back in 1936, you know, was known to have quoted that really only one man in a million can really understand the process. It's that complicated. And so, but, because of what happened to me, Michael, back in the in the late eighties, I was determined to find out exactly how that worked. And through the help of Austrians, I was able to you know understand all the pieces, which if you read how privatized banking really works, you, you get those pieces in layman's terms. And uh the book uh was created from a series of PowerPoint presentations that I developed and actually began to show to commercial bankers. And uh, my very first presentation to a group of commercial bankers, uh, I, I thought I would be thrown out of the room. Actually, they, I was very well received by these, by these men. And I learned that many of them really didn't quite comprehend that that's actually what they did. And of course they couldn't because our Federal Reserve System has been in place for over a hundred years. So, uh, you know, your, your, your typical bank employee or even your higher ups in banking aren't really, I mean, they're, 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 they don't really understand that this is what they do and how they do it. It's just, it's doing business as, as usual for them. And so, uh, believe it or not, they, 
they actually put me on a speaking circuit. So I was going around the country there for a while at, at their invitation to to uh, to show them this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm very respectful of the men that, that did this for me. And I met a lot of great people in the banking industry. And like I said, it was very well received. But I also realized that uh, the, the system has been in place for so long that, you know, bank personnel really aren't aware that they're really doing anything bad. And of course, the, uh, the blueprint for our Federal Reserve System came over from England. And uh, the central bank in England had its beginnings way back in 1692. So this this has been in place. Central banking has been a part of our Western civilization for a very long time, Michael. And so um, we we, if you really look at this thing really hard, you you realize that we don't really have control over banking and nor over our money. I mean, and all of us, every single one of us, whether you're an individual or a business, a government institution, whatever, all of our money, all of our revenue goes into commercial banks. So in effect, it's kind of like the whole nation (laughs) uses the commercial banking system as their cash flow system, principally and primarily their main warehouse for their cash. But most people don't realize that or don't even think about that. It's that one pool of money that um, uh, Nelson Nash talks about as well. Correct. They're very astute. That's correct. And, of course, when I uh, I met Nelson 15 years ago, and um, I was captivated by the title of his book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And I thought, how in the world did you do that? Now, this is after I had learned what I had learned about uh, the Federal Reserve System and how commercial bank. How do you become your own banker? It just intrigued me so much. And uh, the truth of it is, Michael, is that uh, I, I, I read his book several times and I just didn't get it. That's the truth. I just didn't get it. And uh, so I decided to pay him a visit. And even after I met with Nelson for two hours, I walked away disappointed. I could not make sense out of what in the world he was talking about. Because, you know, when, is he talking about life insurance or is he talking he keep talking about banking here? And I just, you know, I just couldn't put it together. And uh, Nelson was so patient with me. And he recognized what was wrong with me. And, of course, what was wrong with me is I was full of what <laughs> he jokes about this. He said, Carlos, when I met you, you were full of Harvard MBA thinking. And, and, and I was. I mean, after all, I knew everything about finance and business. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I was a broker dealer at one time, so I, I knew about every financial product that's ever been created by the, by the securities, securities industry. So I was full of that. I was full of Keynesian thinking is what it was. And all caught up on rates of return, and that kind of stuff. And Nelson was trying to say, it's not about that, Carlos. And again, I walked away disappointed. And it was actually, I'm embarrassed to say, Michael, it was years before I caught on. I'm guaranteeing you this. Once I realized what was going on, what Nelson was talking about, I knew exactly what to do. And this is what I, what Bob and I spend most of our time now doing is educating the general public on this. And, and we try to be real patient with people because we ourselves had a, had a, had a tough time, you know, getting this. And I still remember the day that Bob got it because I introduced Bob to to becoming your own banker. And, you know, Bob being a professional economist, you can imagine what he may have thought of that book. Right. Uh, I mean, seriously. And Bob is probably one of our greatest young Austrians today. And, um, but I still remember the day that it hit Bob 
I mean, he literally almost fell out of his chair. I mean, it was that strong of a of an impact when I when I was trying to get across to Bob. Bob, do, do you not see that with infinite banking, we can all practice a form of privatized banking, um, and we don't have to change monetary policy. You know, we don't have to storm on Washington and, you know, do all that crazy stuff. I mean, we can just do it. Anybody can do it. And Bob, who has uh, had been going around the country, educating audiences everywhere, and he still does it. As an Austrian, he explains the problem better than anybody. Austrians explain the problem very clearly. They, they can tell you what's wrong, exactly what's wrong with the economy. But the solution that the Austrians have at this time is a, a pretty slow process because it's based on education, focusing on the young, and, and uh, hoping that enough of the young people, you know, will begin to, you know, to act in, in the world and, 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 and create an impact on changing monetary policy. Um, one of the greatest Austrians in our day, uh, Ron Paul, I mean, he's a great Austrian. He tried to attack this thing from the, from the top down. And as you can see, he failed. But he also taught a lot of people about Austrian economics, and he made people aware of the Federal Reserve. In, in a way that no one previous to him had ever done, you know, at the general public level. But he failed, ultimately. Uh, Nelson Nash's approach, the fact that any individual and any business owner can, can do this uh, is a form of bottom-up change in the economy. And... Uh, you're going to have to stop me, Michael, because I can go on and on with this. But our book basically is integration and an integration of both Austrian economic thinking and Nelson Nash's infinite banking concept. No, and I like what uh, you guys have done there too. With you explain the problem really, really well. And once you start realizing uh, what's going on with central banking and then central banking enables this welfare and warfare state that, that we live in, um, and then also that most of the inflation really originates at the commercial banking level, and you kind of uh, kind of understand what the problem is, a lot of people usually then will say, well, what's the solution? And here is a perfect solution uh, of, as you mentioned, taking a bottom-up approach, empowering yourself, and creating your own banking system. And I must say, I had a, a similar response to what you had when I first came across this concept. And we we have similar stories where I also had a very big financial setback uh, in within my investing career and, and, and business. And I was looking for answers too. And that's how I came across the Austrian school uh, of thought and eventually infinite banking. Um, so from that point of view, I research everything as much as I can about this concept because <laughs> uh, I, uh, just like yourself, I didn't quite get it at a right away. I said, well, how can this be? How do people not know about this? And you and Bob really did some some research and actually visited and sat down with a lot of insurance companies. Talk about that experience and some of the unique things that uh, that experience taught you and what you learned from it. Well, sure. I'd be glad to do that. Of course, you know, Bob and I are very, uh, we're, we're very uh, aware that um, uh, educating the public, uh, which is mainly our main focus. I mean, this is who we're, we're, we're trying to teach this too. Um, as part of the board of the Nelson Nash Institute, uh, along with Nelson, we, you know, we're taking this message to the general public. And of course, having set up the authorized practitioner program was a must for us. It was absolute must. And you are, uh, Michael, an authorized IBC practitioner. Uh, so, 
we 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 speak to the general public, and when the general public wants to do something like that, we uh, we send them to our authorized IBC practitioners, which are the graduates of the course that Bob and I and Nelson and, and, and David Stearns created for financial professionals. So in that way, we, feel, we can feel very confident that when we send the general public to you, that you're going to take care of these folks and, and help them understand with patience what it is that we're talking about here. Um, so in our journey, uh, Bob and I, even before we wrote the book, we wanted to research this thing from, you know, top, you know, top to bottom and back up again. And so one of our first, uh, 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 marching orders for ourselves is that we need to sit down with these life insurance companies. Uh, and, and, and learn as much as we can from their investment officers, from their CEOs, you know, to explain to us the, the insurance sector, the life insurance sector, because quite honestly, Bob didn't know anything about it, even though now he says that Mises talks about life insurance a lot in his books, and he had just completely overlooked that. Um, Nelson, of course, uh, has always advocated the use of a mutual or a mutual holding company to to uh, to practice IBC with simply because uh, they're different from the stock companies. Uh, in the in a in a mutual, the policyholders are owners of the mutual, and that that uh, that's very important. And that's why a lot of people get confused when you hear a lot of IBC practitioners more or less talk in terms of, you know, uh, putting all their money back into their own system. That's really what they're saying. It's, it's, we own these companies ourselves as policyholders. So, yeah, we want them to do well because we, we, we get profits returned back to us. And so Bob and I needed to understand all that. And so we we visited uh, you know these uh, five in particular of these mutual companies and met with their CEOs, met with their investment people, and uh, tried to understand this this unique financial product. And I say unique because the life insurance industry has many many life insurance pro- pro- uh, products, uh, but the original ones. Uh, were term, which most people are familiar with, and the other one was whole life. Those were the only two. And the the insurance industry is a very old industry. I mean, it's it goes back to the founding of this country. That's how old it is. And so it wasn't really until the 1970s that the life insurance industry started coming up with these other types of life insurance products other than whole life. And it was solely to compete with wall street because in the 1970s is when the stock market really started to call, you know, call out the little guy. And, uh, but prior to that time, most people, save their money in either government bonds or uh, a savings account at a commercial bank where you pay the small interest. But the majority of people kept their money in whole life insurance. And that was the only other product to be had before 1960. And people at that time understood whole life. They, They were very comfortable with it. They knew how it worked. You know, it had taken them safely through the Great Depression when commercial banks, you know, in Legion collapsed, as well as investment firms. But the insurance sector, you know, because of the way it's structured, it held together. And so did these whole life policies. So the the Americans of that day were very, very comfortable with whole life. It was like cash under the mattress for them. So, um, but we have a generation today, Michael, that doesn't even know what it is. And 
uh, our public has been impregnated with very malicious talk about whole life. But they, they, they can't tell you why. They just say, well, I've always heard it's the worst place to put your money. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Right. It's, it's because they don't really understand the product. Uh, this thing's over two centuries old. And, uh, and, and that was the same problem with Bob and I. We didn't have any idea what it was. So we needed to find out what it was. And so we did that research and did that, that investigation. We talked to, to the CEOs of these companies. And, 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 and that was part of the research that we did before we wrote the book. You're listening to Carlos Laura on the Cashflow Ninja podcast. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Are you on track to achieve your financial goals? Income-producing real estate is the most historically proven way to accumulate wealth and has created more financial freedom than any other means. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best turnkey cash flow rental properties. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly income. Get your free strategy session with our knowledgeable investment counselors at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. You're listening to Carlos Laura on the Cashflow Ninja podcast and now back to our interview. And staying on research and investigating, you have done phenomenal work on the Dodd-Frank Act and the content and uh, the opinion pieces that you've written about it. Is this was before <laughs> it even uh, got uh, into the mainstream that, wait a second, there's something else going on with this Dodd-Frank Act. You actually read the act, researched this, and combed through this. So know uh, more than than anyone out there uh, what what it is, uh, what is within it, um, and uh, what what it could hold in store as as far as the the banking relationship between individuals and and banking institutions. Can you share a little bit of insight on the Dodd Frank Act of what it is, uh, some of the pitfalls in it that you've identified, and where do you what do you see the future of this is? Is this something that would be repealed? under a Trump presidency? <clears throat> okay, I'm glad you provided a little bit of an outline there because once again, I can go <laughs> in all kinds of directions here and chew up all your time. Um, I actually, when I think about it, uh, Michael, um, it, it's funny how providence uh, works in a, in a person's life. Uh, I actually uh, used to teach credit uh, at, at a local uh, college. Um, and I didn't do it for college credit. I did it for the uh, National Association of Credit Management, and it was for their top uh, credit analyst uh, to set for a an examination that would make them, you know, top credit analysts. And uh, it was in teaching that course on credit. Uh, in combination with the work that I, I did with businesses, uh, that I became very familiar with bankruptcy and, and the bankruptcy code. And, uh, you know, after all, credit really is banking. Uh, that, that's what credit really is. Uh, that, that, that's one of those terms that, you know, it's, it's lost its true meaning somewhere along the line, but credit is banking. And so when you're teaching credit, uh, you kind of understand uh, that about credit and how it functions in the United States. We all are very dependent on credit. And of course, here again, here's the central bank and commercial banks. This is what they expand and contract in the economy. So, uh, I became interested in an article written by a uh, law professor at Columbia. And I'm going to, I'm having to think back how it was that I stumbled, stumbled upon the, the Dodd-Frank Act. But he was writing uh, an article about contingent capital. And he was the article was basically on contingent capital and what that meant. And he happened to mention uh, the law that that Congress began to pound out 
after the 2008 financial crisis. And they'd been working on it. You know, these two men, Dodd and Frank, were the, the, the ones that were leading up that investigation, that study, and, and that law. It didn't actually become law until 2010. Uh, I think Obama you know, ratified it into law in the summer of 2010. But previous to that, it, it was in the works. And, and so this article was talking about this contingent capital, and it, that's what led me to actually uh, look into the law when it first came out, and nobody really knew it was out. It was just foreign to most people. And uh, it is a, uh, you're right, it's a law, it's a thousand pages long, Michael. It's, I mean, it's, you know, it's full of legalese, and, and it would be very difficult for the average person to even want to sit down and try to read this thing. But when you get to certain sections of it, I was able to read it because it all had to do with bankruptcy and how bankruptcy works. And somehow this new law was going to circumcept all of that. In other words, they were going to bring special powers to the Federal Reserve, to the FDIC, to the SEC, and they were going to basically be, you know, judge and jury on the spot (laughs) to any commercial bank or any financial institution that would fail if there was going to be another financial crisis of the magnitude like what we had in 2009, in 2008. And, and, and what it was built on, Michael, was the fact that it's really focused on banks, but the law basically swept all financial institution, bank or non-bank. I mean, that's how extensive of a blanket it threw over the financial sector. You know, it didn't have to be a bank. And, and it, 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 anybody that was in the financial industry was covered under Dodd-Frank. And that's been one of the biggest pushbacks, you know, because it's really the commercial banking system that has the systemic risk problem. And what I mean by systemic risk is that when one falls, a bunch of them fall, like falling dominoes. And that is because when when there is a crisis, an economic crisis, the people panic and you know well what they do when they panic. They run to the bank to get the cash out. Right. And that immediately brings a bank to its knees. That's when it's discovered that they're insolvent because they don't have the cash. And that problem is created because of fractional reserve banking, which is, again, part of what I was bringing out to these commercial bankers when I was going on that speaking circuit. You guys practice fractional reserve banking. That means that people think they ha- you have their money in, in your vault there, and you don't. You're only required by law because our governments, you know, mandate the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve is not, there's nothing federal about it except that government mandates it. But part of the law uh, says that banks only need to keep, you know, uh, 10% in their vaults, in, in actual currency and coin. The rest they keep, you know, on deposit with the Federal Reserve. And so when some, somebody runs on a bank, you know, you have mass runs, it, it'll bring a, a bank down to its knees. And that's that creates a systemic risk problem because, it carries on to other banks. And so that's what happened in 2008, Michael, because we had like 1,200 banks out of the whole Federal Reserve system of banks, which probably only has about 3,500 of them. You know, that's a, a large part of their system, you know, went underwater. And so we wound up bailing them out, first through the FDIC, you know, covering depositors, but after that, it needed more money, you see. Well, what the Dodd-Frank Act is all about is we can't have another bailout if we have another major crisis again. 
And the reason for that is because the public won't stand for it. You know, I think the little guy finally realized, you know, late, of course, I don't know how else to put it, but that they got screwed. That's taxpayer money that went in to support these huge financial institutions because the thinking was that they were too big to fail. And so we have another major crash. You know, Congress knew that the public, you know, taxpayers were not going to stand for another bailout. So what the Dodd-Frank Act actually does is create a way to have uh, what is commonly known as a bail-in. Now, the Dodd-Frank Act itself doesn't use that terminology, you see. Of course. That's what, it, that's what it is, okay? Right. And, uh, and also, the Dodd-Frank Act is camouflaged in the sense that uh, the whole Dodd-Frank Act itself doesn't just talk about these bail-ins. It talks about other things that have more to do to reassure the general public to come back into the investment mar- markets because everybody had fled them after the 2008 financial crisis. So it was kind of like a protection, a consumer co- protection law to, to create confidence back in, in, in the general public that it was okay to invest back in the stock market and whatnot. So it's somewhat, it's a somewhat, somewhat camouflage law and within that law, we find the structure for the bail-in, which, which we've never actually had that implemented here. Uh, <clears throat> but we saw it uh, tested out, you know, in, in, in Europe, in Cyprus. We actually saw how it works. And actually, government officials liked how it worked. And so did the banking system because they didn't have to use a bailout. You know, they used basically the, the money that belonged to the, 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 that particular banking institution to try to bail it out. Of course, it didn't work, but the, the, the depositors really got taken during that thing. And that's the, that's the part that's a little frightening for us as bank depositors, that if we, if we, during uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, if, if our bank, if our particular bank, bank falls during the next crisis, I mean, our money could get locked up in there. We won't be able to get it out until they figure out what they're going to do to try to bail, uh, bail it out through a bail-in, not a bailout. So uh, I hope that, that gives you a little bit of an explanation of what that is. Now, whether or not Trump will eventually do something about it or not, you know, Michael, I don't know. You know, look how he's acting now. Right. (laughs) You see, so, and and, you know, one thing about Austrians, uh, we more or less know what's going to happen, but we're not soothsayers. You know, we can't really predict the future. The, the future is unpredictable. Uh, anyone that starts thinking that they can sort of tell you what's going to happen and when it's going to happen, I mean, that's, that, that, that's not reality. You know, the, the future is always uncertain. Nobody knows. So, so when you ask me that question, I have to just kind of beg off on that and say, I really don't know. It, it's, uh, it's, I mean, he talks like he's going to do this, but then he does something else. Right. And, and that's the thing about the future predicting business, right? You've got to do it over and over, and eventually you'll be right. <laughs> right. And, and, of course, you're always, going to, you're, you're always going to have a listening audience to that because everybody wants to know the future, Michael. Right. There's not a single one of us that wouldn't want to know the future. But, you know, especially when we're talking about IBC and, and, and Austrian economics and all that, you know, we, we also have to have our, both feet on the ground here. You know, we're, we're not, we don't want to tell people we can predict the future. We can deduce from history what has happened and apply it to what's going on right now as best we can as scientists, as economic scientists, but we can't predict exactly when things are going to happen. But, for example, if you know your Austrian economics, And if you're a practitioner of IBC, the chances are very, very high that you're not going to get hurt in the next financial crisis. Right. 
But Carlos, the core message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. So if you cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Oh, my goodness, (laughs) Michael. (laughs) Uh, I'm humbled by that, actually, Uh, you know, because, you know, I just celebrated my 70th birthday. And I, I concluded that um, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure it's wisdom that you get in old age. It's more about you reach a point where you can look back in time and you, you develop a much clearer perspective. You know, you can see the things that you did that were really wrong. And you see things that you could have taken this, this step and done a lot better, you know, in doing and so, uh, obviously, you know, if I was wanting to, to, to say something to, to people today, I, cause I've made all the errors that you can possibly make. Uh, obviously money and finance is one of the most, uh, uh, it's actually one of the most, you know, stressful things that we have to deal with in life. And simply because of the way the, the, the way the, the, the system is rigged against us, uh, it creates somewhat of a stranglehold for, you know, average families and businesses. And so uh, I think that savings, you know, being able to save money is still very, very important. You know, we, and, and the problem is, is knowing where, to have to, to, to have that money saved. And so I would just say look into IBC and recognize all of what you have there um, and and realize that this is really where you should be storing you know your wealth. You should be using you know um, the, the IBC concept using dividend paying whole life insurance as the as headquarters you know for all your money where it continues to just uh, grow tax free and then deploy it from there if you want to make an investment somewhere I'm all about investments but first start from the proper base so savings is very important um, always recognize that investing investments always have risk tied to them but if, if you can be a good investor and a good and wise investor, you can make some good investments. But always start from your warehouse. You know, where, where is your warehouse? Where is your wealth stored? Make sure it's always earning money and then invest from there. So there would be two things right there. Now, obviously, because, and this is the wonderful thing about this, we've, we're switching from the commercial banking system as our main cash flow system over to you know, the IBC concept, that's now become our cash flow system. And because it has, you know, it is our cash flow system now, um, we, we get amazed that, oh, my gosh, and it's life insurance on top of that. How wonderful. You know, and this is what trips everybody up. We're, we're basically using life insurance for this. Well, life insurance, as we all know, has tremendous tax benefits. And it's, it's something that you can pass on not only the ed- education of IBC to your children and your grandchildren, but you can pass this wealth over to them, you know, income tax free. And they can con- continue to carry that same legacy of the family, the education of the family into the future. So th- those are the three things that I would recommend. Carlos, how can my listeners learn more about you, uh, your fantastic podcast that you do with Bob, and stay informed of all of the projects that you're involved with? Okay, well, I would I would point everybody to um, uh, Laura. That's my last name, L A R A hyphen Murphy dot com. Uh, that's the the name of our our, our main uh, uh, website. 
uh, obviously there you can uh, you know go into the Laura Murphy show which is a series of podcasts you know talking about uh, financial markets um, we also talk about Austrian economics and of course we you know, specifically talk about IBC the infinite banking concept of Nelson Nash's uh, ideas um, we also put out a uh, financial publication known as the Laura Murphy Report. Uh, we post several free uh, of the publications there for people to review for free. And if you become interested in it, you can subscribe and hope that you will and keep abreast of all the things that we've actually talked about on your show. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge and providing so much value for my listeners. It's been a blast having you on. Well, thank you, Michael. I said my pleasure to do it. This is MC Laubscher, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. As you may know, I'm also the president and chief wealth strategist of Alhalla Wealth Financial. We help individuals, families, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and professionals build their wealth outside of Wall Street and help investors maximize the use of every dollar in their personal economy and boost their investment gains. We do this by combining the capital and investments with the financial vehicle of the wealthy according to the infinite banking concept. If you're interested to learn more about privatized banking and the infinite banking concept, you can access an exclusive webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash be the bank. Thank you for joining my guest, Carlos Lara, and myself on the Cashflow Ninja today. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes and share our show with family, friends, and your network. I'm always trying to learn and improve in every area of my life, so if there's any way that I can provide more value to you and serve you better, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. If you're not a subscriber to the Cashflow Ninja Gushku newsletter, you can sign up for our newsletter at cashflowninja.com or text Cashflow Ninja to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. You can also support the show by becoming a patron on Patreon for $10 a month. When you become a patron for 12 months, you get access to our private Facebook page and a Cashflow Ninja t-shirt. Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott have been in your shoes and have used real estate investing to become financially free. They've designed a system to take any beginner to an experienced deal-making investor in the least amount of time. They offer opportunities from basic education, coaching, bridge loan investing to turnkey investments in the cash-flowing market of St. Louis, Missouri. For more information, please visit joinopsproperties.com or call Jimmy and Bob at 314-799-2247. If you're not earning at least 8% on your cash, you do not want to miss the private lending presentation for non-accredited investors done by Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott. Discover how to create an income stream from real estate without the management headaches. You can access the presentation at cashflowninja.com forward slash private lending. Creating passive income for you and your family is easier than you think. All you need are three things. The right plan, the right product, and the right turnkey provider. As an investor, you want a safe, profitable, and convenient way to invest your capital without being at the mercy of stock market fluctuation. Investing in real estate in a turnkey way that provides monthly passive income with very low risk is exactly what Spartan Invest provides for their clients. Their mission is to make investing in real estate easy for the busy professional. Spartan Invest help investors create passive income and wealth through turnkey ownership in Birmingham, Alabama. You can download your free report, Five Big Reasons to Invest in the Magical City of Birmingham, Alabama, at cashflowninja.com forward slash Spartan. The wealthiest families on the planet know how to capture their wealth and then leveraging their wealth through their own banking system. If you're interested in privatized banking and the infinite banking concept and learning the premier strategies of the wealthiest individuals and families on the planet, you can access your free webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash be the bank. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. 
You have been listening to the Cash Flow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness. 